know that uh, we're doing our best to make sure things are working well for you at home, but I'm um, thankful that you're tuning in with us. If you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 1. We just read this portion of Scripture a uh, short time ago, uh, but uh, just prior to getting into the message, I just want to take a moment and to uh, say hi just to a few people. Uh, in this type of setting, it's hard sometimes. Uh, I'm used to people coming in and we get to catch up a little bit on Sunday mornings or Wednesday evenings or different times throughout the week. But uh, I was talking this past week with one of our fine members. Uh, the Teal family lives up in Salem, Connecticut. And Bill and Mary uh, both watch us in their little room, uh, the in their quarters uh, on the Teal farm up on Mike and Sharon's place. And, and so I just want to say hi to Bill and Mary. We, we appreciate you. We love you. We're praying for both of you. Uh, then we also have members that from a long time ago that moved out to Ohio, Lee and Bonnie Wise. And uh, Lee fell this past week and uh, had to have surgery on his hip, but is recovering. So just uh, sending our, our love and prayers to you. Uh, then another, uh, Steve and Lily Rice down in Florida. Uh, we haven't seen them in a while, but we know that uh, they're down there. They tune in when they can. And so uh, we want to let you know that we love you as well. Then uh, how could I leave out my mom? Mom, I love you. I know that you're over in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, thank you for tuning in each week and appreciate you. Uh, but then uh, yesterday, E. Young had a birthday, and I just found that out this morning. I was not uh, online a lot yesterday uh, in the afternoon, and so happy birthday, E. Young. And then I uh, just want to make mention also of one other, or two other people uh, that uh, typically come in and uh, will sit in the, the back of our auditorium, uh, Lee Ann and Josephine. And uh, many people know you, and uh, we love you guys, pray for you, uh, appreciate you uh, sending a uh, text or a note. Uh, from time to time, it's, it's, uh, there's so many more people I could say things about, but those are just some that came to my mind this morning as I was just going through people that uh, have contacted me and, and let me know how they're doing. And so uh, appreciate that. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we get, um, whether it's Facebook messages, or mess messaging or emails or text messaging or even a phone call. Uh, and even snail mail. It's still nice to receive notes and cards from time to time, and so we appreciate all the different ways in which people are willing to reach out, uh, but I appreciate that. In your Bibles, in Acts chapter number 8, and uh, beginning in verse number 1, as we read already, I'm going to give you some background first to this portion of Scripture. Uh, it is hard to know sometimes, especially in this. Uh, we've never experienced this before, to be able to be here in Groton, Connecticut and speak to you at your home, whether it's in New London County somewhere or around the country. Uh, we realize that what a unique opportunity we have to uh, preach the Word of God. Trying to get the climate or the temperament of our church and what the needs are during this time, we could continue in a series dealing with comfort from the Scriptures, uh, but I try to also say, okay, at what point do we turn the corner and try to get things back to normal best we can, at least with the preaching part. And so prior to the pandemic, we were preaching through the book of Acts, and we entitled the series Acts Empowered. And uh, the current text that we're in, Acts chapter number 8, very fitting and ironic as you look at verse number 4, where it talks about the church being scattered. Now they were being scattered due to persecution. Uh, we are scattered right now because of a pandemic that is facing our world and, of course, here in America. Uh, there's a few things I just want to point out uh, about this portion of Scripture that we'll be studying uh, that it is significant in several ways. It marks the beginning of the persecution of the early church. And so historically, as we look back, we see what was happening in Jerusalem and uh, then the persecution that came to the church and how they were scattered or spread abroad. And uh, we'll look at some of the uh, things that took place during that time. It also takes up the story right after the first martyr. Stephen was the very first martyr. Uh, and so it picks up the story right after that. It demonstrates the true faith of those who shared the message of the gospel. The true faith of those who shared the message of the gospel. It demonstrates the irrational or irrational hostility of the established religion against the true gospel. How sad it is to see that people have such a hatred for those who have such a profound faith in Christ Jesus, and yet we see that that was true back then as well it is even today in some places. And it also marks the spread of the gospel throughout the known world, the spread of the gospel throughout the known world. So those are some key takeaways from this today. But uh, sometimes I see 
t-shirts or bumper stickers, and I like some of the statements dealing right now with the church not being able to meet in its uh, locations. And one of the statements uh, I've read from time to time is, you are now entering the mission field. Some churches have that posted on the doors just prior to going out. Some have it in the parking lot. And I think it's a pretty cool statement, thinking the church as it meets here uh, is then uh, empowered, equipped to go out to the communities and to spread the gospel message. And that is a true statement. It's our mission. Another statement that you see from time to time is the church without walls is the church on mission. And that is true as well. The, the walls of this facility don't confine the church. The church is the people and the people scattered out doing the mission work of God is necessary to be obedient to, to our Lord's command. Thirdly, the church has left the building. I've seen that. Actually, I have a friend at another church, and they were giving those T-shirts out at his church during this time. I thought that was a clever idea. Uh, the church has left the building. And then here's one I'd like to add to the list. The church scattered is a church that matters. The church scattered is a church that matters. And so when we consider right now, as we study this portion of Scripture, the, the church mattered because it was being scattered abroad, they took the important message of the gospel to other places that were not receiving that message. And so how important, where you are at right now, you're sitting in your home, but you have contacts that I don't. You have contacts that other people in our church do not have. You may have the ability right now through certain types of online uh, services and, and, and methods to reach people that nobody else would reach except for you. And I would like to encourage you today through this message that the, the church scattered does matter. You matter to someone. Your personal testimony of coming to Christ matters to someone else, whether you think it will or not. Now, not everyone will receive it, but it's still important for you to be willing to share the truth of what happened in your life and how God changed you from the inside out. And so in our text, this is exactly what's taking place. We have the church being scattered. And so let's first talk about what is the church, because I think it's important in our day and age. I don't know who's listening, who's, who's hearing this. Sometimes you've listened to messages so many times, it's just gone over your head, and all of a sudden one time it just resonates. Like, oh, I've never heard that before. And yet as pastor, we say, no, I've taught on that so many times, and now it's the first time you heard it. So sometimes we understand that we just miss things, we miss points. And so I hope today you don't miss the important point of what is the church, because that's a very misunderstood subject in our day and age. The church means a called out assembly. That can be uh, a generic term in the sense of um, us going out to a community just as an organization. That could mean our government that meets together as a called out assembly from its communities. Representatives go to a place. That's a, that, that would be fitting in the term church. We have like in the term church on a spiritual level, that it's the group of people who are saved, they've trusted Christ their Savior, they organize around a uh, core doctrine, and they are coming out of their homes to a location to meet and to worship and to pray and to serve together. That is another definition of the church. And that's the one that we are most familiar with. Now, with that, there's a uh, a right and wrong understanding about the church. Some people believe that their church is the only church that God accepts. Well, that's just wrong. Uh, but yet there are people out there that it's their denomination, and their denomination is the oldest denomination, or their denomination is the only correct denomination, and sadly, they're wrong as well. We understand also that the church cannot save anyone, cannot save a soul. But there are some people that believe, nope, my church, my pastor says this, or my priest says this, and our church is the only right church, we're the only way to get to heaven. Well, that's just not correct. The only way someone is allowed to get to heaven is by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And a church that does not teach that is an error church. And that is something that I'm not apologizing for. That is truth. If you teach or your church teaches that their church is the only way of salvation, then you need to go back to your Bible and study what the Bible says because that was never even on the mindset of the early church. They preached Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And so we must understand that not everyone is familiar with this idea, a biblical idea of what the church really is. And so some have honestly and rightly questioned, why are there so many different denominations? Why are there so many different churches? Let me give you a very simplistic answer to that. One is the pride of man. Two, 
is the attack of Satan. Uh, no doubt that uh, if you can't beat him, join him, might be a mindset of Satan as he tries to intermingle uh, false teaching along with uh, what looks to be true. And we find that through the years there are many cults and isms and schisms that have come out of the truth. And they've changed the, the, the terminology, they've changed the meaning, and they get you to believe just enough to go along with them saying that we preach the truth. And slowly over time you start realizing, whoa, they're not teaching the truth as it once was taught. And it's so important that we understand there's core doctrines that we cannot compromise on. But there's methodologies that change. The problem sometimes is that people confuse their uh, practice of their church with the means of salvation. In other words, if you don't do these things that your church says, then you can't go to heaven. Again, that's a false teaching. The only way that someone can be assured of salvation, deliverance from their sin debt, is by trusting in God, in the person of Jesus Christ, and what He did on our behalf, His death, His burial, His resurrection. So I don't want you to have any misconceptions about what is being taught here and what the church really means and what it stands for. And so what we see here, the fact that the church is scattered in the early church, we would call this my church, meaning Jesus' church. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, the my church of Jesus was a, was a church that had a very simple format. It had a very simple, clear understanding of its doctrine. And sadly, through, down through the centuries, we have really muddied the waters on what the real church ought to be. So, even our church, we're a Baptist church. Well, that's because we have certain core uh, teachings that we, that we practice. And so, but that doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven through a Baptist church, nor through the Catholic church, Presbyterian, Methodist, Congregationalist, Pentecostal, non-denominational. None of that matters for your salvation. And so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here because it's so important that those who are part of God's true church are those who have personally trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so please don't let the names of denominations, the names of, of religious uh, groups uh, thwart you in believing the truth of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what is that gospel? The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, and many of the portions of Scripture, this was what was being preached by Stephen and by others, and that's what brought upon the persecution to the early church, because they were preaching that this Jesus who was crucified is now resurrected. It is the proof of our hope of eternity, and the proof that Jesus truly was the Messiah they were waiting for, that He is God. And so those who believe that message spiritually, were changed from the inside out. So it's more than just an intellectual knowledge. It was a heart knowledge as well. And they trusted Jesus Christ and something changed inside of them, as was my testimony over 30 years ago. When I asked Jesus Christ to come to my heart and change me, man, he changed me from the inside out. I can't explain it. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect. But I knew that I was different, and I started now living my life trying to honor God. Sometimes it was two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it was one step forward, two steps back. But over time, God kept working on me. And the more that I spent time with him, the more that he kept changing me from the inside out. But when I first trusted Christ, that was it. That settled my destiny being heaven. And so the first thing I want you to look at here with me today is the promise of the Father. Because we're talking about the church being scattered, according to verse number four. But we have to go back to understand what was the purpose of this church and why was it scattered. And so if you follow along with us since we started this series on Acts Empowered, I gave an acrostic that I came up with to kind of give us a, an understanding of the, the key things that we'll study throughout the book of Acts. So the letter A stands for ascension. If it wasn't for Jesus ascending up into heaven, then uh, the Spirit of God, according to the Scriptures, would not come and empower us to do the work, empower the early church and us to do the work that God has had, has us here to do. The letter C stands for church. And of course, this is a transition period. Jesus, my church, was starting and it was being empowered to do the work and carry on the work that Jesus had started here on this earth. The letter T stands for transition and trinity. We learn about the trinity in the book of Acts. We also learn that it's a transitional period uh, for uh, those early, uh, the early church and for those coming from Judaism to Christianity. 
And then the letter S is for salvation, the true message of salvation by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So let's look, first of all, at the promise of the Father. Go back with me to Acts chapter 1, if you would. Acts chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 5. And I want you to notice it's here because there's something significant stated in verse number 8 that helps us to understand what's happening in chapter 8. So, verse number 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the, what? Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Now, why'd they say that? Because in their mindset, the Messiah, when he was supposed to come, based on all the Old Testament prophets and the prophecies, he was supposed to come and deliver them from their oppression. So their mindset, he, they were thinking that Jesus was coming now to set up his, his kingdom, his eternal kingdom. But that was not the plan at that particular time. Verse number 7. And it says, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power or his authority. But, very important now, ye, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be what? Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the, of the uh, earth. Now, Verse 8, that latter portion there, go to chapter 8 and verse number 4 again. Chapter 8 and verse number 4. And it says here, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Go back to verse number 1. And it says there, Against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So here we have, from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus mentioning that he was going to leave and he was going to send the Spirit of God to empower them to be witnesses. Now a witness was someone who was able to not only testify what they seen, but in this case the word witness there, as I mentioned before, meant they were willing to die for their faith. Now most, most Americans, we talk about being willing to die for your faith uh, we're so used to a, a more lackadaisical mindset in American culture, where right now over in foreign countries, people that meet for their uh, secret church services and people that uh, meet together to pray or talk about their faith are in danger of dying for their faith like they were during this time that we're reading in Acts chapter 8. They were being persecuted. And people today are being persecuted for their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And something that is hard for us to comprehend here in America, but yet it is going on. And it went on here in our text. And so the promise of the Father, what is this in reference to? Well, it was the, the promise of the Holy Spirit empowering, which is still available to us today in the church, those who are true believers. The purpose is for witnessing. We are called to be witnesses for Christ. If you've trusted Christ your Savior, you've been enlisted. You are to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Note the locations in verse 1, 8 and chapter 8, verse number 1 are imperative to understanding this. God was wanting them to go forth of their own volition and spread the gospel. To this point, as far as we know, they weren't doing that. And persecution came. And it's, it forced them to be scattered out. Right now, if I could... But a current application, we, the church, are scattered abroad because of a pandemic. And we are on our own, choosing not to come together and meet and to uh, uh, have our time of, of fellowship together and prayer together and time together like this. And thank God for technology. But we recognize that we are scattered right now. So let me ask you a question. What are you, as the church scattered, doing to be a witness? Some of you, I know, you're doing it. Some of you are, are online, that you shared your personal testimony, you wrote it out. Some of you have chosen to uh, videotape yourself and post that. And I would encourage you, please do that. Keep it short, keep it concise, but share your personal testimony. Some of you have reached out to family members and friends. Some of you, people have asked you, hey, you're a Christian, what's going on? It is so important that you don't shy away from being a witness of your faith in Jesus Christ at this particular time. Use it for all it's worth. And to be and understand where people are coming from. 
They may not be willing to receive it right now, but keep the dialogue going. Keep the conversation going. Allow God to use you as the church is scattered. Allow God to use you right now to be a witness to others. The second thing I'd like you to look at here is the preaching of the true gospel. Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 53, records Stephen, the first martyr, his message. And man, was this an eloquent message. This was something that if you were to go back and study a message, how to speak to someone of the Jewish faith, Stephen did an exceptional job quoting Old Testament and bringing it forward to the fact of the conviction that, hey, this is what you have done, and you need to understand this. Well, it didn't work the way he wanted. We would love to say that all those people there that heard Stephen's testimony and heard him preach this amazing doctrinal and, and scriptural message, that all of them converted to Christianity and said, yes, this is what we need. No, it enraged them. It made them so mad that he would go against the established religion that they sought to kill him, and they did. So we have Stephen being the first martyr for preaching the true gospel. This was a messianic gospel that he was relaying to them about who this Jesus Christ truly was and who he is. And so then we move uh, forward here about this, uh, what's going on in Stephen's life, that he, was in, he, he enraged the religious Jews who sought to silence those who would profess their faith in Jesus, whom they crucified. And so Stephen was a man who boldly preached and ministered to the people, encouraged them to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. He was not someone who was going out just stirring up trouble. But the message of the gospel, you'll find, will incite different responses. Some people that are ready and that the Holy Spirit is convicting them, they, they can be very emotional, they can be very much desirous to receive Christ. And on the opposite side of that, there are people that just get enraged and mad and they'll be critical of you and they'll be uh, mean-spirited. It's amazing how the message of the gospel, if, if people out here don't want to believe it, just think it's fake, then why do they get so worked up? I always find that very interesting, why people who don't believe it get so mad at those of us who truly do believe. Why would they get so enraged at, at us just for believing that Jesus Christ truly is God and he died? That, that's an interesting personality, but yet that is, that is what exact, that's what, uh, actually what happened here. And so they sought to kill Stephen, and they did. In verse number 1 of chapter 8, verse number 1 of chapter 8 actually tells us of the man who was there, background to Saul, he was sent on a mission by the religious leaders of that day to go ahead and persecute any Christians, to arrest them. In our text, it says they dragged them out of their own houses. Now, can you imagine, Christian, right now, because I'm here at 950 Gold Star Highway and I'm preaching this message, and you're at your homes, if, if, if in America, can we ever imagine a day where Christianity would be illegal, and they found out you were watching or reading your Bible or having a prayer in your home, and they were to come in and drag you out of the house and arrest you, and in some cases, kill you? I don't think we can imagine that. But yet, that's exactly what was going on. And these are religious people, the people that are supposed to be ministering and, and, and comforting and helping. But yet, they were so enraged at this new teaching of faith alone in Jesus Christ that they were willing to go about and to violate others. Listen, may I say this very clearly? A forced faith is no faith at all. A forced faith is no faith. I can't... Even if I could tie someone up and make them pray a prayer, if they truly don't believe it in their heart, then what is, that's not faith. That's coercion. And so we must understand that people must by faith come to Jesus Christ, not by coercion, not by being tricked. They must truly have an understanding of the gospel. They must, it must resonate with them. The Spirit of God must come in, convict them, and they must then pray and say, yes, I know I need this. That's true conversion. And how many people attend our churches that truly don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They truly are just believing because someone else told them to do something, pray a prayer, do this, that they just went along with it. They're religious, but they're still lost. And that's the way many in, in religion truly are. And so what we find here is that the reaction of the Jewish leaders was not remorse, but hatred. <clears throat> the rage of Saul uh, demonstrated that dragging people out of their own homes and, and Putting them in prison was the attitude of this religious mindset of that day. 
And then lastly, I want to share with you the priority of the persecuted, the priority of the persecuted, and this was the scattered church. What was their priority? Well, in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 4, it tells us quite clearly that they went abroad, went everywhere, preaching the word. Well, what was the word they preached? It was the good news, the gospel, which is the good news that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead. Now, you could imagine people hearing this message for the very first time. How would it resonate with them? How would they, if you came to a city that never heard of Jesus Christ, and yet you preach this message, and these people say, okay, so you're telling me that this guy who is a Jew, that the Jews didn't like, they put him on a cross, they killed him, but he rose again from the dead. And if you talk about it in that way, if you just say it that way, who would believe something like that? That this guy died to pay for me? But what we understand is that the Spirit of God was empowering the message. Boy, I could try to prepare my best gospel message, wax as eloquent as I can, which I am not, as you know. And I could try to give you the, the best in, information about why you should trust Jesus Christ. But it will fall on deaf ears and deaf hearts if the power of God is not present in the person's life who's hearing the message or in my life who's preaching the message. It's so important that we understand that it is God who is the one who converts the soul, not man. It must be God. And so we leave the message of the truth to God. We are to present it as witnesses, and they must be convicted by the Spirit of God to receive it. And it's amazing how that is true in so many places around the world that never heard of Jesus, but somehow when they hear the true message of the gospel, the Spirit of God comes in and takes their dead spirit and makes it alive now, and they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Oh, the testimonies can go on and on of people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But let's look at what uh, Peter and John said. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 4 here quickly. Acts chapter number 4, verse number 18. I want you to see this because sometimes you'll say, why would you waste your time being a pastor? Why would you teach people a bunch of fallacies? Why would you go about trying to spread that, that message? I mean, we understand you're doing good for people and feeding the poor and helping people out and being there where people are dying, but why, would, why do you believe that message? Notice in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse, verse number 18 through 20. And it says, And they called them and commanded them that they not speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Here's after Peter and John are preaching, healing people, that the religious leaders once again came and said, You guys are not allowed to preach or teach in Jesus' name. Verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Oh, that that would be the testimony of every true believer out there. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard or what we have experienced ourselves. Listen, John Ludka many years ago trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And as I've said it before, I can't explain it, but something internally changed. The Spirit of God, as I've learned to study and understand it, he came in and changed me from the inside out. Now, that doesn't mean that I live as a perfect person. But I know that now I had a desire to live for God. I had a desire to honor God in my life. I had a desire now to know more about God. I, I, I felt guilty for sins that I never felt guilty for before. And I wanted to start cleaning up my life and living a life to honor God. That's what the Spirit of God does. He helps you to understand His truth. He helps you to now desire other people to come to know Him and I can only speak from my experience and what I, I study from the Scriptures. Here's John and Peter saying, listen, you can beat us, you can imprison us, but we can't but speak the wonderful truth that changed our life. Jesus Christ truly is the Savior. That was the message being spread abroad now because of persecution. Everywhere they went, they told people about Jesus Christ being the true Messiah. Well, what are people's actions during the time of persecution? No doubt some shrunk away. They got scared, which I can understand. But some became emboldened. And they were preached and they taught others no matter where they went. What would cause these people to find other places to meet, knowing that persecution was following them? What would cause these people to keep speaking the message? What would cause these people to go everywhere, knowing their message was a death sentence if they continued to preach it? It was genuine faith that changed them. 
They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew that it was true. They knew that it changed them. And so that motivated them to just keep preaching the truth no matter where they went. Millions of Christians have been and continue to be persecuted for their belief in Jesus Christ around the world even today. How sad it is in a world that cries for peace, rejects and ignores the only one, the true God, who can bring that kind of peace. But they can't receive it. Peter and John's words, when told to stop witnessing, demonstrated their true faith. Let me ask you a question. What hope do we as Christians offer to those who have survived the coronavirus only to meet God as their judge someday? I'm all for, you've heard me pray. I pray for our scientists. I pray for our doctors. I pray for our president, the governors, the mayors, all those who are doing their best to keep us safe and to find out a cure. But what good is it if you're cured physically from this coronavirus, but someday you'll die and you'll go to hell? Because you do not have true faith in Jesus Christ. If only right now we have hope to get through this life unscathed, what hope is there for eternity? Listen to what is said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Think about that. That was a reference. If the resurrection wasn't true, then we don't resurrect how miserable would it be to know that as a Christian, we've served our whole life, but heaven's not true. God's, God's a liar. But we know in our hearts that's not true. We know He is real. We know that He is our confidence. In reference to us being witnesses to others, listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not, uh, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. I speak this to my shame. If there are people out there that do not have the knowledge of, sa of, of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, shame on me who has the cure for their eternal destiny, and yet I keep it to myself. The church scattered is the church that matters. If you and I truly want to matter to God, if we truly want to practice the empowering of the Holy Spirit that He promised to give to us as witnesses, and we must find ways, even while we're scattered, to be a witness for Christ. This week, I was so blessed. One of the young ladies in our church, Mariah. Mariah, if you're out there listening, you moved me so much by your testimony online this week and brought tears to my eyes. And if you could find that, Mariah Liebig, hope I'm not embarrassing you, but if you want to go and find her on Facebook, she posted this. And what a tremendous testimony. And that testimony could be repeated by so many people from our own church and around the world that have come to true saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you, if you're out there and you have an iPhone or, or uh, uh, any other type of phone that you can record yourself and post your message of salvation, post it. Let people see what you really believe. May it encourage others to come to faith in Christ, knowing that what you believe is real. It's not fake, it's real. Well, let me just make some concluding comments here. How can we spread the gospel right now as a church that's scattered. Well, I just mentioned about video, mentioned earlier about maybe you uh, printing something and posting it online. You could text someone, you could call someone, you could write letters, you could hand out gospel tracts right now. People aren't wanting to receive anything by hand, but you could find other ways. There's amazing online content that you could share with people, find out what their, what their questions are and post them post those things to those people. Send them to our websites. We're, we're populating our websites here at the church with information about how people can have faith in Christ. But listen, we are called to be witnesses. The early church was called to be witnesses and they didn't go about it the correct way. They stayed in Jerusalem. God allowed persecution to come and it scattered them abroad. May we, during this time of this pandemic, maybe take a little heart check was I being an effective witness prior to this? Was I really doing what God wanted me to do as a witness? Now the church is scattered. There's different formats. There's different ways in which you can be a witness for Christ. So what's the takeaway? During this time of our church being scattered, pray for the lost. Pray for the hurting. That's something all of us can do. 
Pray that God puts someone in your path or someone that you can contact, that he'll put someone in your heart and your mind and that you could be a witness to. Look for proper information to share with people. Maybe you know something about the person's background and you can find information that might be more, uh, something they might be more interested in reading about the gospel from a different perspective. Depend on the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God wants to work with those who truly want to obey Him. And if we truly want to obey God and we're living our life to honor God, that God can empower us to do the work that He's called us to do. But God's still in charge of the results. Remember, Jesus Himself preached the truth and He was rejected. The apostles preached the truth and weren't always accepted. You may preach the truth and not always find a welcoming heart but we're just required to give the message. Be ready to rejoice. Be ready to rejoice with those who trust Christ. And so I would encourage you, as we consider our text here once again today, in Acts chapter 8, it was because of persecution that the church was spread abroad. They were scattered abroad. But they went everywhere preaching the word of God. I would encourage you, with all the different posts you're posting out there, preach the word of God as well. And ask God to empower those words to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you for the privilege and the blessing of being able to stand here still at the property at 950 Gold Star Highway and to preach this message in a building that you have blessed us with. But we also know that this is not the church. This is a lot of concrete and steel and metal and sheetrock and carpeting and paint, but it's a building. It houses the church when we're able to be in session. But right now, as you know, our church is scattered out there among the towns. On a larger scale, all Christians, true believers, are a part of your church. And we all have the privilege and the ability right now to be a witness for you. May you help us to be a good testimony as being a witness. Maybe our lives have not really reflected Christ-likeness, and we need to get our hearts right with you first. And I would ask that you would please help anyone listening right now who's a Christian but has been living for themselves, which is a danger for all of us. I've been there before. I understand that. Forgive us. Help us to 